Christy McManus is a registered nurse by trade, an avid reader and enthusiastic book lover all her life. Her debut album, Our Vengeful Souls, will be released summer 2023 by CamCat Books. When she isn't writing, she enjoys photography, art, and napping, which she considers to be a form of cardio. She lives in Toronto with her husband. Go for it, Christy. Thank you. Um, so I'm Christy McManus, and my debut novel, Our Vengeful Souls, was released just last week, June 6, from CamCat Books. It is a young adult villain origin story of the sea witch from The Little Mermaid. The section I'll be reading is of the betrayal that not only set in motion the events of my novel, but is also a possible catalyst for the fairy tale we all know of The Little Mermaid. Where are we going? I glance around the endless open sea. There are no signs of life, no markings to indicate our way as we leave the borders of the kingdom in our wake. When Trayton said father wanted us to train again, I expected to be led to the arena. But as he exited the palace, cutting through the gardens and down the narrow streets until we were met with nothing but the sandy ocean floor and sparse black rock, my heart rate began to increase as though by instinct. Triton, I called again, speeding up to match his pace. Where are we going? He doesn't turn as he answers, his golden hair tied back with a long black string. The outskirts. I skid to a stop, glaring at his back, incredulous. The outskirts. Why in the world? He spins on me like a water spout, eyes blazing. Are you afraid, Soraya? I think I would think after your heroic display the other evening, nothing would be up beyond your skill. My eyes narrow to slits, fists clenching. We're not allowed in the outskirts, I remind him, though I know he's fully aware. Surely, Father? Father wants to test us, he interrupts, the sharp tone of his voice replaced with a soft touch of persuasion. The waters here are dark. They'll challenge our vision. The cold will force us to work through the pain and to control our muscles. Master Bourne was planning to bring us here soon, and Father doesn't want us to be unprepared and embarrass him. Begrudgingly, I realize he's right. The arena is safe. We're monitored closely, facing off against each other in what has become a somewhat predictable outcome. As the chill of the water cuts my body, the darkness straining my keen eyes, I understand the purpose of this exercise. Maybe he isn't testing us, I think silently. Maybe he's testing me. Maybe this is the final step in proving to my father that I am actually worthy. With a single nod, I concede, urging Triton the last few miles of the outskirts. By the time we reach the rocky, violent waters, I can no longer feel my body. The current pulls and pushes, keeping my muscles in constant tension to avoid being washed away. The light from the moon is no longer visible at the steps, obsidian night enveloping me from every angle. If it wasn't for my immortal vision, I would be lost. Once content with our location, Triton turns, tossing me a blade. I catch it easily, turning it over in my hand. It's not one of my own, not one of my favorites, but it'll do. I twist in a past, I twist it in a practice swing, listening to the melodic sound of it cutting through the water as Triton readies his own sword. I can see it too is not one of his usual choices. A black hilt with a large ruby at the base. The blade is a brilliant steel, deadly and sharp. With a nod, I invite him to strike. He cuts through the water with lightning speed, barely giving me enough time to lift my blade to deflect his attack. The moment we connect, he pulls away, spinning back to me to come again, the sound of our blades colliding in a steady, musical song of precision and lethal force. Soon we fall into our dance. We battle for hours, the impact of our swords and fists, the only sound in the sea. I'm panting through the pain, the exertion of the fight, and the effort to keep from being controlled by the current is an ever-present opponent. Pulling back after yet another strike, my lungs screaming for oxygen and muscles struggling to obey my command, I move to raise a hand to pause. But Triton ignores the sign, lashing out without warning, his blade slicing the skin of my upper left arm. I hiss against the sensation, the blade so sharp I don't immediately feel the pain as my blood seeps into the water like red clouds skittering across the sky. I place my right hand on the wound to staunch the bleeding as I shoot Triton a withering glare. You idiot, you drew blood. While I expect him to appear abashed, his sword to drop and his apologies to spill from his mouth, instead I find a broad smile on his lips, his eyes luminous in the darkness. The way he stares at me evaporates my courage. Triton, what? My words die off on the tip of my tongue as the wound burns with such intensity the oxygen is sucked from my lungs. I gasp a breath, pulling my hand away to staunch to look at the cut. It continues to bleed, red coloring the water, but there's a distinct blue tinge marking the edges. I furrow my brow, lips parting as I turn back to face my brother. 
The moment I try to speak, my lungs spasm without control. I have no choice but to release my wound, my hands coming to my throat as I struggle to draw oxygen from the water and into my body. Before I have the chance to register what's happening, a torturous pain cuts down the center of my tail as though a blade were slicing it in two. I look down with wide, frightened eyes, thrashing against the agony, and watch in horror as my tail slowly transforms into two separate limbs. Shooting a frantic look to Triton, I try to scream for help as he moves closer to me, but I cannot find my voice. His lips curl into an ugly sneer, the white light behind his eyes obscuring his face. He still grips his sword in my hand, fists clenched around it tightly. It's a poison, and it didn't come cheap, he explains, eyeing me with a curious tilt of his head. I had to pay double the usual going rate to have the blade impregnated with a suitable dose, plus a bonus for the vendor's discretion. As he moves to circle behind me, I reach out, grappling to clutch his arm, but he jerks away easily. You're not as cunning as you think, dear sister, and not as cautious as you should be, although this time it's not entirely your fault. It was Ashira I followed yesterday to your little hideaway, not you. You, I will grudgingly admit, are harder to track. Pulling in a breath, my lungs burn as water fills them rather than oxygen. I choke against the sensation, coughing uncontrollably, torn between the pain in my tail and the desperation to breathe. I heard everything, Triton growls, moving back into my eyeline to stop right in front of me. That mother wishes for you to ascend, that father is foolishly considering it, all because of, all because of one lucky night with magic. His lips curl back into a sneer as his hand shoots out, wrapping around my throat in a crushing grip. I gasp against his hold, nails digging into the skin of his forearm, but he doesn't relent. I will not lose the throne to you, he spits through gritted teeth. I will not allow you to shame this family and to dishonor me. But you are still my sister, and I will not lower myself to killing you. Instead, I came up with the next best thing. With a jerk, he pushes me away harshly, eyes following along my body to my tail, where his wicked grin grows. Tears well in my eyes as I look down to find that my once beautiful, powerful tail has been replaced with human legs. My eyes bulge, spots of light flashing before them as I suddenly realize what he's done to me. He's turned me into a human. So I'll stop there. Um, I will also be doing a giveaway. Um, the winner will get a hard cut back signed copy of the book as well as some other swag. <laughs>